So dear students, you are welcome again in this class. We continue with the topic factors affecting plant growth. In the previous lecture, you have seen uh, different glossaries and a factor affecting plant growth, their classification. Large number of factors affect the plant growth. Just to refresh your memories, you can see there, there are two kinds of factors, external and internal factor. External and internal factor and external factor are three, environment, management, and socioeconomic factors. Environmental factors are two, abiotic, biotic. Abiotic are wants plus light and biotic factors. So we started discussing the genetic factors or internal factor, which are important. You see, a eucalyptus plant is very tall and grows very fast and it is perennial as well. And take the case of lentil, very small plant. So it is all in genetics. Even within, within a particular group of uh, plants, you will find variability. In mango, take the case of mango. Some are very bushy, very tall, and some mango varieties are small. So it is all in genes. But environment is equally important. For expression of genes, you need environment. So in environment, you have uh, abiotic and biotic factors. So in abiotic, we started with the temperature. And we have seen the effect of temperature, role of temperature, and temperature stress. Whenever we speak of stress, it doesn't mean always high or low. It includes both the cases. If you have high temperature, then also you will have kind of heat stress. And if it is very low temperature, then you will also have cold stress. You have seen chilling injury or freezing injury is there. So temperature have both kinds of stresses on the plant, high and low. And optimum temperature is there. Generally, C3 plants have lower requirement, lower temperature requirement than C4 plants. You've seen the differences in nutrient concentration or accumulation in root and shoot part. It is variable, variable with the temperature. At lower temperature, certain nutrients are accumulated more in root then in shoot and vice versa. Now you have also seen that temperature affects the soil pH. During summer, it reduces the pH and during winter, uh, it increases the pH. It affects the pH. A uh, lot of uh, harmful, uh, harmful effect of low temperature is there on the plant growth. You have seen chilling injury, frost injury, and plants were classified based upon these, and you have also seen growing degree days calculations. And now you have also seen the modification manipulation. Now we start the next abiotic factor, environmental factor, that is water. Water is very, very important. And sometimes you call it moisture also. Moisture generally referred to the uh, total water, including water vapor also. However, if you say soil water, it does not include water vapor. Generally, that is the difference in soil water and soil uh, uh, moisture. Moisture is mostly under unsaturated conditions of the soil. We call it soil moisture. So you can call it water as a factor or soil moisture as a factor. And it can have two kinds of uh, stresses. In one situation, you can have excess water. In another situation, you have uh, low water or deficit of the water. Both cases may be there. So before we proceed further, let us know why water is important for the plants. What are the roles of water for plant? You please come forward and tell me the role of water in plants. Yeah, Dev Malaya. Dev Malia, are you there? Yes, sir. I yes, request, sir. Yeah, please answer. Why water is important for plant? Sir, water is important for plant in many cases, like uh, in transportation of minerals in plants to regulate the temperature of the plant, Good. to uh, regulate the transpiration rate in the plant yeah. for uh, different bi uh, biological activities of the plants. 
yeah. and many uh, and many kind of uh, like uh, utilization of uh, energies or uh, like photo respiration and respiration in every cases even even uh, even in um, so uh, this kind of many cases what is yeah, good very good very good but we can start with protoplasm you know protoplasm is the basis of life and protoplasm should have water if it is dehydrated yes, if water is taken out from the protoplasm cell will die so yes, uh, basically it is part of protoplasm we can start from here and then most important role of water is in photosynthesis photosynthesis and 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 uh, your um, uh, transport transport of minerals as you said within the plant system water has its role and indirectly water in soil is also important for movement of nutrients movement of nutrients through diffusion or mass flow or through contact exchange so this water is playing very very important role and also in the availability of the nutrients in soil so it has some direct role in the plant when it is taken up by the plant when it is absorbed by the plant it can regulate the temperature of the plant while in the plant and also it is part of uh, essentially required for photosynthesis and protoplasm it has some indirect role also that support the plant growth indirect role as you know nutrient availability transport these are indirect role of water uptake of nutrients so water is really very very important if water is not there plants will not grow however as as a student you know that the water preference butter water preference in soil for plant varies from plant to plant some plant will require wet conditions or even aquatic conditions your rice rice needs lot of water if your soil is full of water rice is always happy if you take out water water stress may be there in in rice so water stress can be faced by rice take another example another example of pulse crops pulse crop like moong bean uh, black gram your uh, pigeon pea even soya bean if you put extra water extra water in sorghum in palmillet in in some other zero phytic plants if you put some extra water little extra water they will die most of the plant cannot tolerate water logging i named them some pulses and and many zero phytic or all zero phytic plants they cannot tolerate excess water so what happens why those plant die plants of zero phytic nature or say say mesophytic nature which require moderate quantity of water mesophytic plant require moderate quantity of water zero phytic very less or little water is required and for hydrophytes or aquatic plants lot of water is required so what will happen if zero phytic plants are uh, in, in those condition if you have water logging or zero phytic why why do do they die they are not able to absorb oxygen they are not able to, because, able to absorb because lack of because lack of uh, and uh, because anaerobic condition are prevail there that's why they are not able to uh, get oxygen in in a form out of oxygen for their metabolic activity and so many activities correct so uh, and, and how this rice survives or many aquatic plants survive in the because they they use their parent kymen tissue of their leaf for the oxygen transportation that's why yeah. they are able to survive in that condition yeah parent kymen tissues good so now I, i hope that many of you could get that why, why the zero phytic plant cannot survive because of lack of oxygen lack of ox oxygen they suffer more but in rice and aquatic plants there is some mechanism through which oxygen is tr transported from the top part from the shoot to the root however roots cannot live no plant part can live without oxygen roots also require oxygen for their activities very good so now we go to the next level see the role of water or moisture in soil water required for life life cannot happen without water if you know the first life on earth it came in water some cyanobacteria or whatsoever was there or blue green algae they first came in water so water is required for life source of hydrogen and oxygen you know that uh, our body body of living things 
is primarily composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Carbon in plant is about 40 to 42%, and oxygen is almost same amount, 40 to 42%, and hydrogen is say, 6 to 8% hydrogen, and some nitrogen and other minerals. So it is fundamentally part of our body, and water contributes for hydrogen and oxygen. Manufacture of carbohydrate in photosynthesis, you know, water is used uh, to produce, uh, to complete this photosynthesis. I think you must have seen how water is needed in photosynthesis. Essentially needed in photosynthesis, maintenance of the hydration of the uh, protoplasm. It is necessary for hydration of the protoplasm. Movement of nutrients in soil, nutrients in plants, translocation of manufactured food from, or distribution of food from leaf to other parts, and moderation of temperature. So these are the important role of water in plants life. Uh, definitely both low and high levels may affect the growth of the plant, as I already discussed. Moisture stress reduces cell division and enlargement also. If you have excess moisture or excess water, reduces soil aeration. Supply of ox oxygen available to the root is reduced. With poor aeration, activities of beneficial microbes also reduce because these microbes also require water, optimum water conditions. Water and the nutrient uptake reduce except rice. And if it is a moisture stress, excess moisture or low moisture deficit. So in moisture deficit, closing of stomata will happen reduce transfer for uh, transpiration therefore reduce photosynthesis reduction in cell division and elongation and finally this will result in reduced growth and crop yield so this is also important now you see very interesting fact about uh, water and water has very positive interaction with the nutrients so nutrient water interactions are there they are always there almost always there. So see here, response to nutrient is moisture dependent. Suppose if you have in dry land conditions or under rain fed conditions, for the same crop, the nutrient requirement is less. However, in irrigated agriculture, where you have assured water supply, the recommendation of nutrient is high. So irrigation, uh, suppose you have sufficient irrigation, under identical conditions even. So you will uh, require uh, more uh, nutrients if your uh, fields or soils can be irrigated. And if irrigation facility is not available, water is not available, then nutrient requirement or nutrient, nutrient recommendations are lower. So see this case, it is effect of nitrogen fertilization on yield of rapeseed under irrigated and dry land conditions. So just try to understand this picture. This is nutrient water interaction. So on x-axis, you have applied nitrogen kg per hectare to rapeseed crop, uh, 56, 112, 186, 226. So the nitrogen application rates are increasing on the x-axis. On y-axis, you see the rapeseed yield kg per hectare. See, there are two lines. The first line, first line is for dry land conditions where there is shortage of water. The rate of application of nutrients is similar under both conditions, but you see the yields are high under irrigated condition. This one is your irrigated condition and this one is your dry land condition. So you can say nitrogen is same. The only difference is in water supply. If you supply the water, you can harvest up to 2000 kilogram per hectare of rapeseed. But if you do not have water, the N application is same, then you can get at most 800 kilograms of uh, rapeseed yield. So you, so you can very clearly see here that if you have water supply, sufficient water supply, the response to nitrogen is high. If you have, if you have limited water supply, then the response is less. Means one kg nitrogen under irrigated condition will give you much higher yield than under dry land conditions. Is this picture clear to all of you? That the, uh, the response to nutrients is water dependent, means moisture dependent. So under irrigated conditions, you get more response than in dry land conditions. 
Now see one more interesting, this is not just yield. The, the quality, the quality of the material is also affected by uh, water. Newton water interactions are there, but many times the excess or, or the under irrigated conditions or excess water supply conditions and excess nutrient supply conditions, the concentration, the percentage concentration of certain nutrients reduces. Here again, this uh, inverse yield nitrogen law is applicable in this case also. If you want more protein, if you want more nitrogen, the biomass yield will be less. And if you have more and more biomass, the concentration of nutrient is low. So here you can see on x-axis, you have available soil water, water availability. If you move from left side to right side, from five to 20, then the water supply to the crop is increasing. So this is protein content in grain and soil moisture supply. How protein content in grain is affected by moisture supply. So generally higher protein percent at low extractable soil moisture. So this uh, low soil moisture has some positive effect that it will improve the quality of the cereal grain, particularly wheat. In wheat, it will give you more protein. That is why many of you uh, might wonder that why MP wheat, MP wheat is in demand. MP wheat is Madhya Pradesh wheat. Because in Madhya Pradesh wheat, wheat is primarily grown as a rain-fed crop. And under rain-fed conditions, those kind of wheat will have more protein. So their chapati making, making quality is good for Madhya Pradesh. So here <coughs> you see available soil moisture on x-axis. On y-axis, you have the yield of the barley plant. This is for barley plant. Barley uh, uh, behaves like your oats or wheat. So yield, and then you have four nitrogen application rate. Four nitrogen application rate. First, you see these up, upward graphs, upward lines. So this line, nitrogen is 180 kg. So it is giving you highest yield, 3600 kg per hectare barley yield. If nitrogen is 120, it is giving less yield. Then if nitrogen is 60, it is further less. If it is control, no nitrogen then the yield is lowest. So this is about the yield. And also you can see the available water supply on x-axis. If you are increasing the available water supply, the yields are increasing at all the levels, even under control condition, where you have not applied any nitrogen, the yields are increasing with the increase in available soil water. You see this. So first thing is that higher levels give you higher yields, then the lower levels. Second thing is, as you increase the water supply, the yield increases in all the cases, whether it is control 60, 120, or 180 kg nitrogen per hectare. See, another interesting fact about the protein. These lines, this is Y2 axis. Y2 axis is protein percentage is 20, 15, 10% protein. So what is happening to the protein? If you apply 180 kg nitrogen, the protein content in the beginning is highest. Similarly, in 120, next lower, next lower, and then 60 and zero. So it decreases with decrease in nitrogen level. Highest protein content is at 180, then 120, then 60. But interesting fact is at, uh, that at the four, all the four levels, you see, it is declining. The protein content is declining. You have, if you have 180 kg nitrogen per hectare, protein content may be about 14%. And if you have reduced the level 120, it is uh, say 13 and a half or something like that. At uh, 60, you will have about 12%. And at control, you will have 11%, something like that. So you can see that with the increase in water supply, the protein content is decreasing at all the levels of nitrogen even at control. So if you have highest supply of water, the lowest uh, protein content is in control, and then in 60, then in 120, and highest in 180. Is this picture clear to you about the yield and quality getting affected by the available uh, water supply as well as nitrogen application rate? It is kind of interaction of uh, uh, nitrogen and water on 
yield as well as protein content. Could you understand this picture, this graph? Hamesh? Hello, sir. Yeah, is it clear to you or you want to ask uh, anything? Sir, um, you have said the reason for the inverse yield nitrogen law. Sir, yeah, in that yeah. law, there is a relation between nitrogen, but sir, you are talking about the water relation and protein with water relation. So, how did this happen? Actually, uh, you know that yield or growth of the plant is affected by both. It is not just water, but nutrient. It is not just nutrients, but water, water also uh, affects the growth. It can improve the biomass production. So, that law is basically indicative law which is with respect to nitrogen, inverse yield nitrogen law, that if you increase the biomass yield, biomass yield, the nitrogen content decreases. Uh, that biomass yield can be, cannot be just increased by the nitrogen application, that can be increased by other factors also. So therefore, this concept can be extended to other inputs also. Say water, he has given just case of nitrogen. Same can happen under certain soils for potassium also you can get response to potassium, response to phosphorus or other nutrients also. So therefore it is uh, not that, uh, I, I'm just here extrapolating, extrapolating that law. Does it satisfy you or you have further cross question? You are welcome. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah. Now, water stress and nutrient availability. So, you know, I uh, already told you that nutrient move to the plant root through diffusion mass flow and then root interception and contact exchange. So, high or low water stress, as already told to flooding, excess water. What happens? Reduced oxygen supply and restricted root growth or root respiration and re reduced iron uptake. And furthermore, if you have excess water, then the aerobic microbes or aerobic organism will die and their function will be taken up over by anaerobic organisms. So uh, high moisture may induce certain diseases and enhance activity of certain crop pest. It has been reported that certain diseases, uh, disease increase will be there. You know about uh, Akiochi disease in rice. It is because of uh, anaerobic conditions, hydrogen sulfide is produced and that can affect the rice plants. Now, can we modify the moisture? Sure, it is in, in our hand up to some extent and we can apply water irrigation. If it is in excess, then we can go for drainage. Mulching can also be practiced to conserve water and then anti-transparents can be used under dry land conditions. So up to some extent, we can moderate uh, or modify the moisture condition in the soil. Now, after water, we go to the light. So light is definitely ultimate uh, limitation, energy source. It is energy source. Photosynthesis, it is necessary for photosynthesis. Uh, uh, I'm not the first person to tell you that light is necessary for photosynthesis. It is always required for photosynthesis. And in this case, uh, there are three important things in light that we need to study. Light intensity, uh, light duration, and light quality. Intensity, duration, and quality. There are three aspects of light. And we also know visible is spectrum is more important for photosynthesis. Uh, and the light intensity and light duration, they are governed by the latitude and uh, latitude of the place as well as climatic conditions and it establishes the ultimate yield level because light is really very very important its duration its intensity so anybody knows about uh, light intensity what is light intensity or what is light actually what is light and what is light intensity Can you, can anyone is that light mainly sir, um, uh, is the flow of um, photons mainly that EMR and the light intensity means sir in a particular area how much uh, light is or the sun rays is falling 
at a particular time that is light intensity right very good so it is the actually the density how dense the light is that is the meaning or in other words you can say that uh, brightness brightness as the brightness increases brightness of light increases the density increases so intensity is actually brightness of the light good now light intensity is like brightness and is measured as the rate at which light energy energy is delivered to a unit of surface or energy per unit time per unit area both light and heat energy comes from the solar radiation and interestingly you can remember the unit of light intensity the brightness in in earlier days it was food candle food candle later on uh, some uh, it was not very scientific or lux etc those units are not used now langley is the international unit of light intensity now the langley l a n g l e y langley l y is a unit of energy distribution over an area also called density of heat it is used to measure solar radiation it is used to measure solar radiation or insulation incoming solar radiation the unit was named after samuel uh, pierre pont langley l a n g l e y langley you should remember name of this unit in 1947 so one langley is equivalent to one thermochemical calorie per square centimeter so it is on area basis how much is received on one square centimeter 41840 joule per square meter or per meter square or it is equivalent to 11.622 watt hours per square meter so these are the three units of one langley these are three conversion of one langley now you see light intensity is uh, very very uh, different for different plants some plant would like to have lower light intensity and some would like to have higher light intensity particularly plants under temperate conditions or winter conditions need less light intensity and plants which grow in subtropical or tropical kind of climates or environment require higher light intensity or or you can generalize that normally your uh, tropical c4 plants like maize or your sorghum or sugarcane they require high light intensity and plants like wheat or say mustard they require uh, low light intensity so here you can see on x axis you have uh, l l is the unit ly langley ly per minute this is per minute and on y axis you have a rate of photosynthesis this is uh milligram co2 per decimeter square per hour so on y axis you have photosynthesis rate on x axis you have light uh, intensity so you can see for maple maple may be some uh, temperate plant so for maple you can see that the the uh, the best results are obtained when the light intensity is less than 0.5 less than 0.5 and if you go on increasing the light intensity further there is no change rather there may be decline in photosynthesis similar behavior is observed in oak however for orchard grass you require more light intensity higher light intensity as you are increasing the light intensity up to say 1.4 or 1.3 then this orchard gra orchard grass uh, is doing well more photosynthesis but see the case of maize maize it needs very high light intensity more light intensity and it is increasing you can see it is increasing up to 2 or 1.8 langley so the light intensity requirement is different for different plants therefore you have uh, you have certain shade loving plants plants like uh, turmeric turmeric will not prefer high light intensity it would prefer lower light intensity there are many perennial grasses perennial grasses which are grown in under plantation conditions in kerala or some other states those grasses are shade loving grasses 
means less light intensity is required. However, plants like even rice, it, it likes to have very high light intensity. High light intensity, the photosynthesis is increased and yield is also increased. So in rice, uh, several experiments have been conducted with respect to light intensity. And yields of 10 ton, 12 tons can be harvested by increasing the light intensity. Such kind of work has been done in some other crops also. Now see the light intensity, a relationship between uh, light intensity and leaf area index and your CO2 fixation or CO2 assimilation. You know, photosynthesis is also called as carbon dioxide fixation or CO2 fixation or carbon dioxide assimilation or also food assimilation. Same thing, photosynthesis. So, uh, Apparent photosynthesis in corn, milligram CO2 per decimeter square ground area, uh, 15 minutes per 15 minutes versus intercepted light, Lang, uh, light uh, Langley per 15 minute at three leaf area indexes. Just try to understand on X axis, you have light intensity from 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 per 15 minute intercepted per 15 minutes, not for one minute, it is per 15 minute intercepted. And you can see in, in the three LAIs, one is 1.8 leaf area index. That means the number of leaves are less, the leaf area cover, uh, covering the ground is less. But if you have 3.3 .3 higher leaf area index, means it has more leaves, more vegetation, and 4.5 here has the highest number of leaves, size of leaf and higher vegetation, higher greenery here. So what happens in all the three cases, you can see the CO2 fixation is increasing. If you increase uh, leaf area index for all, all the three here, of course, the fixation rate is less when you have this solid 1.8, 1.8, but it is highest in case of 4.4. You can see this 4.4, this uh, square shape is structure, 4.4. So this picture tells us that as you increase the leaf area, leaf area index and increasing in light intensity will result in increased photosynthesis. More leaf area index means more leaf area and you increase the light intensity, the photosynthesis increases. So therefore, whenever agronomy students, they, they do their research work in different groups. So you always uh, record leaf area index, index. So it has a relationship with photosynthesis. Now you can see that shading can reduce the light intensity. How to manipulate the light intensity? Is it possible to manipulate the light intensity? So of course, by some planting techniques, we can manipulate the light intensity or we can reduce it. Of course, we cannot increase it, but we can reduce the, the light intensity. Of course, by alteration in time of sowing, if we know that light intensity is generally more during this particular month, then we can uh, somehow uh, altered the sowing time also. But, so welcome back. Uh, we were continuing, uh, continuing, we continue the effect of light intensity. And you can see that light intensity can be reduced by intercropping system. You know, in intercropping, we grow uh, different kind of crops. Uh, uh, their heights may vary, heights may be different and one's leaf will have some shading effect on other. Uh, mixed cropping is same as intercropping and agroforestry. So in agroforestry also, we can reduce the light intensity. See, this is quite common. You, you see these plantations for, uh, can, can you recognize these trees? Anybody can recognize these trees by seeing the pictures? This is agroforestry where you go timber trees or fruit crops along with your uh, agricultural crops. So that is your agroforestry system. So can you identify this uh, trees, tree component? Anybody? Areca nut, sir. Uh, it is not areca nut actually. Areca nut, uh, uh, I think it is common in Tamil Nadu and 
some other southern states. This is uh, um, turmeric. Yeah, the crop is turmeric. Sure, this crop is turmeric, but the tree component is is this is poplar. 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 Yeah. yeah, this is poplar. Dear, uh, have have you seen the poplar plant anywhere? Yes. Good. Yes, sir. So poplar plant is quite popular popular in uh, northern states like Punjab, Haryana, UP, MP, uh, central state. And I have seen some uh, poplar trees in, in Srinagar also. In Srinagar, their height is less. Their height is less, uh, uh, but you will find this poplar tree. Similarly, if you grow eucalyptus in Srinagar, first thing is it will not grow. If it grows, then its height will be less. I have seen eucalyptus plant in Turkey. So they were very short, uh, short plant. Height was very short. In Turkey is somewhat uh, a country of temperate to uh, subtropical, subtropical kind of country. So the height, uh, because eucalyptus is from Australia. So anyway, uh, so this kind of system, because this turmeric requires low light intensity, Therefore, it can be successfully grown under shaded conditions. Now, light intensity and duration are important for crop growth and development. What happens? Photosynthesis at low light. If you, you do not have sufficient light intensity for the plants which need high light intensity or moderate light intensity, then your plants will be etiolated. They will have small leaves, bud blades, poor pollination and poor fruit quality. So you in light intensity also, you have to have optimum light intensity. Photosynthesis is stopped at high light intensities. Same as in case of temperature here also, if you give excess light intensity beyond the optimum level to a particular plant, the photosynthesis is stopped. Of course, plant differ in light requirements. Some, as I have shown you in one picture, some would need higher light intensity, may be optimum for them. For some lower light intensity, may be optimum. Certain seed require light to break the dormancy, like lettuce. So in this case, light is essential for germination. Now there are photomorphogenic photomorph responses. The, the growth of the plant is affected by uh, some photomorphogenic responses. So you can go through the details of this phototropism, photonasty, photoperiodism, and photomorphogenesis. So these are the four uh, physiological phenomena that are affected by light. Tropism, photonasty, photoperiodism, photomorphogenesis. Now, for example, photomorphogenesis is given to the wide range of light controlled developmental responses. These include effect on seed germination, stem elongation, leaf expansion, development of chloroplasts and synthesis of chlorophyll, etc. Now, let's go to the uh, photoperiodism light duration. So you have seen the intensity of the light and uh, the uh, yeah, intensity. Now you are seeing the duration of the light. So duration of the light, the behavior of the plant in relation to day length, duration is photoperiodism. Short day plant, long day plant, day neutral plant, I think you know it. What are the differences in short day plant, long day plant? And they, they are based upon the light duration, particularly for flowering purposes. Similarly, uh, for temperature, I forgot this vernalization is also there. For certain seed, require some, some cooling period, uh, which is your vernalization to induce the flowering. Now, light color, similarly, uh, uh, intensity, duration, and light color is also important. You know, there are seven colors in the light. And in certain colors, you will have more photosynthesis, more growth. But nature is giving us white light. Under open field conditions, you have white light, which have seven colors. And those colors are going to the crops and doing uh, assisting in photosynthesis. So under open field conditions, you cannot uh, give the colored light. 
but under greenhouse conditions, under protected cultivation conditions, up to some extent, you can give the color, colorful lights to the plants. So you know seven colors are there. So uh, uh, which color would have highest rate of photosynthesis? Light color. Sir, so red. Red, red, red or blue. Red. 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 red and white. Yeah, most of the time it is red color. Red color. And uh, if you compare both blue and red, then red is having the most uh, most efficient one. But many times, if, if, if choice is given, then you can say blue and red. So, but if you uh, see between these two, it is red color, which give you maximum CO2 fixation, carbon dioxide fixation. And of course, it is not feasible under field condition. If you want uh, to give a red light, red light to the plants, go to uh, greenhouses and there it can be done. Similarly, I forgot to tell you in duration, duration of the light, short day, long day, and, and day neutral plant. For short or long day plant, you can artificially give them light or artificially cut the light. Means you can manipulate the darkness period and you can get the flowering also. Flowering in off season by manipulating the darkness and light period. Similarly here also in case of color, you can uh, increase the photosynthesis by giving red light or blue and red light more to the plants. Now, wind, wind is also a factor uh, affecting the plant growth. So by now you have seen some, some factors like temperature, uh, water and light. Temperature, water and light. Now wind, uh, light wind necessary to replenish CO2 near the plant. So wind has both positive and negative impact on the plant growth. Sometimes it can have mixed effect, sometimes it can have mostly negative effect, and sometimes mostly positive effect. So light wind necessary to replenish CO2, CO2 near the plant, carries oxygen away from the plant, so ex exchange of gases, you know. Uh, less wind, less evaporation, less water requirement. You know, if you have more wind, more dry conditions, then transpiration is more. Typhoons can be very dangerous. And in India also, in the coastal areas of the country, you can see some typhoons or some, uh, what is the name, storms. Some storms come and they uproot the trees. So they definitely affect the growth of the plant. Lodging can happen in crops due to heavy winds. Of course, wind breaks can minimize the damage if you have a problem of uh, windy weather. It has uh, dusting affects rate of photosynthesis. Sometimes this wind can carry the dust. Uh, wind can carry the dust. Uh, in Rajasthan, uh, some student might be knowing during certain period of the year, in certain months, some dust storm uh, come to even up to Delhi. I have seen dust storm coming from Rajasthan to Delhi. Uh, it is quite common in some Arabic countries, Countries, this dust storm. Those who watch cricket matches can, can find sometimes matches stop because of dust storm if they are uh, organized in this uh, Saudi Arabia or UAE. So this dusting can affect photosynthesis because dust can come to the leaves and it will cover the leaf surface may uh, blow away or bring pests and diseases. This is both positive and negative. So it can bring some, some useful insect pests, a uh, useful insect or friendly insect near the plant, or it can take away the friendly and bring the, the, the problem causing pests and disease. So it has both kind of influences. May interfere with the farm operations like spraying, etc. May aid in pollination. So it is necessary for pollination in certain crops. So you can see that wind as a factor affecting plant growth has mixed response. Composition of atmosphere. Composition of atmosphere, you know, uh, atmosphere contains a variety of gases, particularly here we are dealing with carbon dioxide, which is necessary for photosynthesis. And some reports suggest worldwide that the biomass production is increasing in the world mainly because of increased level of carbon dioxide. On the one hand, we are cursing carbon dioxide that it is responsible for as a greenhouse gas 
responsible for global warming. But on the other hand, people claim that it is increasing the green D, green D in the world, particularly because rising temperature can, can be a limitation under temperate conditions. So there, uh, certain plants can, 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 uh, can be adapted, can grow by receiving warmer climate and they, their photosynthesis efficiency improves. But overall, people have done many experiments that what should be the maximum level of CO2 at which you will have maximum photosynthesis. So most people say that it is up to 1000 ppm. Normally now it may be 360, 370 ppm in our atmosphere. <clears throat> but if you take it to 1000 ppm, then it increases. If you keep the, uh, the respiration constant and other things constant, and just take consider the photosynthesis at a time, then up to 1000 ppm, you people have found the increased photosynthesis. Reduction in growth at 1000, 3000 ppm and 5000 means if you take it further to 3000 or 5000 ppm, there will be adverse effect on the growth. In the atmosphere, you get certain toxic substances also, acid rain can be there. This acid rain can affect the plant growth adversely. You can have ozone, ozone and some other toxic material that can uh, reduce the plant growth. Now friends, uh, uh, we have covered the environmental factors, external fact in external factors, and now uh, abiotic factors. Now we are seeing the biotic factors. So I'm not going into the much details of these biotic factors. As you know, that weeds, they, they will compete for nutrients, water, space, and light. For four resources, they will compete with the crop plant and they will surely reduce the growth. Similarly, insect pests, they feed on the crop and they damage the crop and reduce the growth or reduce the production of the uh, biomass. Uh, diseases, similarly disease or nematodes, viruses, they can also adversely affect the growth of the crop. And certain uh, domestic and wild animals, they can also uh, damage the crops and uh, many wild animals, you, you must be knowing blue bull or neil guy, etc. So these biotic factors are, are important. And interest, interestingly, they have some lot of interactions, lot of interactions or competition through their association when they come in contact with each other. They have variety of uh, associations. For example, insect pests. These certain insects may, may not always be harmful. Harmful, they, you can find some in a friendly insects also. Uh, rhizobium uh, legume symbiosis, there are many examples. And some, uh, some plants or some biotic factor interact, interact through allelopathy by releasing certain chemicals into the environment, they interact with each other. Now friends, uh, you have seen that there are four major factors. Uh, one, one was related in, in the external factors. You have uh, uh, environmental factor, managing, management factor, socioeconomic factors. Now you see management factors. In all the crop management practices, what we do in agronomy, I already taught you principles of crop production. All the uh, practices of crop production, I would say, practices of crop production will affect the growth of the plant. Land preparation and tillage. Tillage influences because if you do not do tillage, proper tillage, as per the old convention, then your growth will not be good. Now people say that your growth is better under zero tillage conditions and so on. So different opinions, different places, uh, you cannot, uh, one shoe cannot fit all sizes, you know. So this zero tillage may be good, but it may not be good under every soil condition, climatic condition, and crop conditions. Soil, climate, and crop conditions, the zero tillage may not be perfect answer. Similarly, your selection of a variety, as already discussed, this is also a management subject. Of course, it is uh, it, it coming under genetic factors, but here selections are made by the farmers. Seed quality, seed treatment, seed rate, nutrient management, all these agronomic factors or cultural factors will affect the growth. Disease, insect, and weed management. Here it is management. 
crop rotations, soil erosion, soil organic matter, all these factors uh, or management practices will affect the growth. Some socioeconomic factors are also there that can affect the growth of the plant. Lack of availability of input seeds, fertilizer, pesticides. So definitely you know the, that the quality seeds are important and you, you need at least some quantity of fertilizers and pesticides to, to grow the crops. And you have already seen in the management factors, you need good seed, you need good nutrients and some pesticides. So main thing is availability. So lack of availability is there. So if you are watching news regularly, you will find that many times during the sowing time of the crops, farmers would stand in long queues uh, to buy fertilizers. They are standing in rows to buy fertilizer and they are fighting. Many police cases are there. So black marketing is also done in case of fertilizer. So uh, you can see that resourceful, uh, resourceful farmers, they would have access to fertilizer, but farmer who is lacking money, who is not very influential, who is a simple farmer, poor farmer, he may not have access to fertilizer also. So therefore the crop, which is grown by this uh, economically poor farmer will have poor growth than the rich farmer who can spend money, who have power, uh, muscle power, I shouldn't say it, but those who have access to fertilizer or resources, uh, they, their crop will do better. Lack of credit facilities. All farmers may not get credit from some organized sector. Most of the farmers, they get credit from unorganized sectors where they charge a lot of uh, interest. So surely we say that the number of schemes are there for farmers. Uh, uh, KCC, Kisan Credit Card is there. Uh, uh, government uh, farmers can borrow some money. But again, problem comes here also. Inadequate information on prices of inputs and produce. Marketing problem is also there. Uh, poor marketing system, land holding size, smaller land holding size is there. Education background, farmers are not educated. So you, if you have two kind of farmers, farmers, those who are educated can do better. The, the crops grown by them can have better growth than the farmers who are less educated in general. I'm not saying this is universal economic condition of the farmers. So this finishes this topic. I think we are in well in time. Now we have enough time for discussion. Uh, 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 your reactions, comments. Uh, are you, uh, So are you there? Hello? Yes, sir. Okay, you are very, yes, sir. very quiet. I was thinking that you, you, you are not there in the class. Anyway, so uh, if you have anything in your mind, any anything related to factors affecting plant growth or principles of crop production, anything in your mind, you can discuss now. Have you started reading the books I suggested? One is by Tisdale or Havlin, Havlin, Soil Fertility and Fertilizers. And one is by uh, Brady, or you can say Well and Brady, W-E-I-L, Nature and Properties of Soils. Just you open your videos, I can take pictures and, and uh, um, say bye to you and we will meet next week monday okay so now you can ask questions your faces okay, are seen sir. yeah anything you like or should i ask should i ask you should you take quiz your your quiz now tell me uh, uh, 
why urea is preferred fertilizer? Why uh, urea is number one fertilizer in India and in the world? Uh, more than 80% uh, nitrogenous fertilizer consumed in India are urea. Why it is so? It contains high nitrogen content, sir. Okay. This is one. So cheap price. Yeah. Cheaper the government than other is providing price. subsidy. Okay, but government will give subsidy on other fertilizer also, which have nitrogen. Suppose ammonium sulfate is there or calcium ammonium nitrate is there, wherever nitrogen is there. So farmers will get subsidy. It is for per kg nitrogen. So not for fertilizer, it is nutrient-based subsidy. So it is not just this subsidy is given on urea. All the nitrogenous fertilizer, they are subsidized. Uh, uh, subsidized. For example, DAP, diammonium phosphate. It has both nitrogen and phosphorus. It is subs the nitrogen part is subsidized. The nitrogen part is subsidized and phosphorus part, part and potassium part is not subsidized. Therefore, uh, DAP bag cost farmer 1200, 1300 rupees, but many farmers are buying it. Urea bag uh, is uh, 260, 270 rupees. So, uh, and one of you was saying that urea um, uh, contains high nitrogen. That is not true. Uh, if you see uh, this uh, liquid uh, ammonia, you know, liquid ammonia, how much nitrogen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. 80% nitrogen. And, and that is quite common in uh, USA. In United States of America, they use more of uh, this uh, anhydrous ammonia. We call it anhydrous ammonia, not liquid ammonia. We call it anhydrous ammonia at, at low temperature and high pressure. You know, this ammonia is, is converted to uh, liquid form. And then you can put it in the cylinders and those cylinders storage structure can be connected to the tractor or machine and that can place this ammonia directly into the soil. So in USA, they are not making urea. They are not making urea because to make urea, you need uh, more uh, reactions. You know how this ammonia is produced? First reaction is nitrogen <clears throat> and hydrogen in one is to three ratio. You need high temperature and then you make ammonia. And if you can uh, put some pressure and make it liquid form and apply directly, so the nitrogen will reach the soil. But to make urea, you need to combine this ammonia with carbon dioxide. So one more reaction is required where also energy is used, <clears throat> efforts are used. So it, it should be the cost of production will be more per kg nitrogen in case of urea compared to and address ammonia. So therefore, they prefer, and in some European country, they, they used to make this ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate was a common fertilizer in Europe. Now they have stopped it because this um, um, explosive, this is used as an explosive material. They use it in bombs or as an explosive. So therefore, in India, people added some calcium carbonate or some calcium materials to make calcium ammonium nitrate. So this is all just I wanted to interact with you. Uh, so urea, uh, because you can say that it is cheaper in India, whatever fertilizers, because we in India, we do not have facility for uh, anhydrous ammonia use. So we rely mostly on urea. So the answer should be that it is the cheapest source of uh, nitrogen, cheaper source of nitrogen. Is easy in apply, easy. In, one time I asked a student why urea is preferred source of, so he replied that it is white in color, it looks nice. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. Uh, I, I should end it here. Just I, let me take your attendance.
so thank you very much my dear students and uh, have a nice time nice weekend and uh, you can contact me for any problem you like and uh, next week again at least one extra class you, you should prepare for one extra class next week next week i would like to take three plus one four classes okay see you on monday thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.